So the next session, now that it's 11 o'clock and we can start almost pretty promptly, um, let me explain to you on Scopus, right? So <clears throat> there were a lot of questions just now from people asking on the difference between Scopus and Science Direct. It's a very good question and something which most people would be generally perplexed because it's owned by the same company. So Science Direct itself is a content repository where we publish all the journal articles that are submitted over to Elsevier journals. So you get the full text article. Think of it as a full text database. For Scopus itself, it's what we call an abstract and indexing database. So we put in the abstracts of more than more publishers than just Elsevier. So it's over about 6,000, 5,000 publishers worldwide, including Springer Nature, Wiley, etc. So in this case, you get a very holistic overview on what articles there are out there. You just don't have access to the full content yet. So what people normally do in their workflow would be to do a research, to do a search on Scopus first, to see if that there's an article which engages them, and then they go to the database to obtain the full text content. So I think this is actually more or less on how the approach is like. So today, what I'll be sharing with you is how we can introduce Scopus, what content there are in Scopus, how you can search for Scopus, the source browser and the journal analyzer, how you're actually able to obtain research excellence and additional help and resources. So first and foremost, let me actually introduce Scopus to you first. So you're probably aware of this chart that I shared with you during the Science Direct training. The key thing which I really want to share with you is that we know how difficult it is to search, right? And this is why Scopus tries to improve on the efficiency of the, the search methodology. So I mentioned that we are the world's largest abstract and citation database of peer-reviewed literature that allows you to track, analyze, and to visualize scholarly research. So we have approximately about 77.6 million items. We have over 16 million author profiles and over 70,000 affiliation profiles, including USM. So some of you will be asking, why is it that um, we have author profiles created without us knowing? It's very simple. Whenever you actually co-author a research article and the article is indexed within Scopus, we create an, an author profile for the author that's contributing to it. In this case, it really helps to make life easier for everyone because we want to expedite the efficiency of it. So Scopus itself, allows you to identify and to read and to analyze which journals that you may want to read or you can submit to because you can make an informed decision about it. We allow you as a researcher or an early career researcher to manage your career on your research career via citation counts and your H-index through the author profile. It's a very good platform too for you to decide where and with whom that to collaborate with because this is actually much more effective to track the impact of research and to monitor global research trends as well. You also know what currently exists in the global world so you are able to find out what content there is out there, what are the latest trends, so to actually work on this latest trend as a very good stepping stone to research. So at the same time, you may find how to differentiate research topics and to find ideas for you to do your research as well. So this is very, very important. The way we do, we curate content on Scobus is very crucial. So there are actually over 105,000 journals in the world today, only of which only about 47,000 are actually peer reviewed. Scobus, is, Scobus indexes approximately about 24,600. And we also want to make sure that this is globally represented. So we have a lot of content throughout the rest of the world in terms of North America, Middle East, Africa. Within Asia Pacific, we have about 2,200 journals, which is about 265% more than our nearest competitor. People will be asking us what content there are in Scopus. So with 77.6 million records, it comes across a whole range of content, right? Be it physical sciences, health sciences, social sciences, and life sciences. 
The journals include peer-reviewed journals, trade journals, Go open access journals, and we also include articles in print. Within the conferences itself, we have about 120,000 conference events and up to 10 million conference papers. We also have quite a significant amount of books as well, in terms of book series, items, books, and items. Yes, Awo, do you want to type in the question that you have? So there's a question here from Payao on what's the difference between an active scholar and peer review. So there is actually no difference here. So, oh, unless you're referring to the previous slide, I see. Okay, so to go through with you something quickly here, active scholarly titles means that they are journals, right? But this doesn't necessarily mean that they have been peer reviewed yet because not all journals are peer reviewed. So this probably should clarify a little bit with you. So we have also been collab collaborating with many other publishers in the world. We have over more than 75 million records. We collaborate with um, Springer Nature, Taylor Francis, Wiley and Blackwell. So for instance, what you can see is that Elsevier contributes about 11% of content, but not all Elsevier content is automatically indexed within Scopus. It doesn't work that way. So think of this as a separate product. There's a separate team that decides entirely if a journal is good enough to be indexed within Scopus or not. Usually, these people are third-party third experts called the Content Selection and Advisory Board. I'll go through them with you in more detail later and subsequently. So as a result, Elsevier only contributes about 11% of all its content. Well, only 11% of all content comes from Elsevier. 7% of content comes from Springer Nature. 5% from Taylor & Francis, 4% from Wiley & Blackwell, 2% from Sage, 1% from Walters Cooler, 1% from IEEE Oxford University Press, for instance. So we have been working together with quite a number of um, international organizations, including Times Higher Education World University Rankings, um, the QS World University Rankings, Financial Times, and OECD, as well as McLean's. These are some of the global um, organizations that we have been working with. So Scopus is actually very widely used and collaborative with the rest of the world. Someone's asking, not all Elsevier articles are indexed in Scopus. I would say not all Elsevier journals are indexed in Scopus. That's right. And for you to access Scopus, it's very simple. Simply go to scopus.com. So based on some of the ranking systems, we wanted to share with you on how the percentages for some of the rankings are working like. So for the QS World University rankings, um, Scopus provisions the citations per faculty data. For Times Education, it falls under the research under volume, income, and reputation component. So this is where we actually provision the data for both QS and Times Higher Education to do this. So we talk about Scopus, Scopus selection criteria for serial content, right? So this applies only for journals itself. So the people who decide on which articles are indexed, which journals are indexed in Scopus would be what we call the Content Selection and Advisory Board. They are third party body of experts. But first and foremost, the criteria which they are ascertaining on which a journal is good enough to be indexed on Scopus will be broken down into these five key components. This is what we call the title suggestion phase. There is the peer review. All, artic all journals have to be peer reviewed. All articles in the journals need to have English abstracts. Because while we understand that many researchers can write um, research articles in their own language, English is still the global language of scholarly communication. The journals itself have, have to be regularly published. They need to have Roman script references, and they also need to have a publication ethics statement. It's only after the title suggestion phase has been completed that it's passed on to the next phase. So the next phase would entail the CSAB to basically review the eligible 
titles according to 14 quantitative and qualitative selection criteria. So we break it down into five key components under journal policy, the quality of content, the journal standing, the, the regularity in which the articles are being published, as well as the online availability. So under journal policy, you need to have a convincing editorial policy. All journals need to be peer reviewed. You need to have a diverse geographic distribution of editors, as well as a diverse geographic distribution of authors. This is very important. Of course, the quality of content is very crucial. There needs to be significant academic contribution to the field. The abstracts must be written clearly. It needs to conform with the stated aims and scope of the journals. The articles must be readable. Journal sending is um, justified by the citedness of journals articles in Scopus. Basically, we are looking at the number of citations it's been generating for itself, as well as the editor standing. All journals have to be published on a regular basis, and all content has to be available online. You need to have, at the very least, an English language a homepage. So someone has a very interesting question. What if, and I think that this is something very crucial. Like, I think that, that there has been a surprise amongst all of you that not all Elsevier articles or Elsevier journals are indexed within Scopus. I would say a majority of them are, but not all of them are. If you're interested to find out if a journal is indexed within Scopus, simply type in the journal itself, and I'll show you how to do this in just a bit. And then you'll be able to identify if the journal is actually indexed within Scopus or not. So this is to help you make your life easier as well. Sorry, Mushfik, you're asking for literature published index in ISI ERA on a specific area, topic, and field. But that's, I'm a bit confused here because I'm not sure what you mean by collecting, if you're able to search in Scopus, but you're not able to collect literature's index in ISI and ERA. So first and foremost, ISI is a web of science. It's a completely different platform. ERA itself is basically, if I'm not mistaken, if you're referring to the um, emerging um, journals, this is a diff completely different uh, platform and source as well. So Scopus, ISI, ERA, these are completely different platforms. What are Roman script references? For instance, if you're actually categorizing it, you know when you're doing your reference list, basically you do it in that specific format. And some of you have questions that I've covered across on what it means to be peer reviewed. Some of you also have questions on how the journal can be indexed in Scopus. Let me show these to you as I go on through the slides. So to, I thought this would be a very good idea for you to actually understand how the entire workflow for Scopus is like. First and foremost, we have what we call the title suggestion phase, right? This is a part where I showed you the five key criteria over here on peer review, English abstract, publications, references, and public ethics statement for you to understand. So first and foremost, when you submit an article, so this actually happens from the journal editor and publisher point of view. So if you want to be selected and to be indexed within Scopus, you need to submit this to us for consideration first. The publisher, the editors, and the editorial board members, you all are the ones who take the decision to choose to push for this specific journal to be indexed within Scopus. This is when you go towards the title suggestion form. If the title is recommended, it will go on to the next phase, which is what we call the title validation phase. So all the journals itself would have to go through the Scopus minimum criteria track. You have a criteria feedback. If it's met, then we'll pass you an enrichment form on how the pub journal publisher can improve onto the journal. We can enrich the title and then it's released to the CSAB for their review, for the subject chair to ascertain if the journal is good enough, and then for you to be indexed within Scopus or otherwise. So Scopus, this entire workflow process really comes from a journal publisher slash journal editor point of view, right? Some of you will be wondering, and I thought it'd be interesting to share this with you because as early career researchers, you've probably heard of a lot of terms. What does peer review mean? 
peer review means that the article has to be scientifically verified, right? And each peer reviewed article, it would be submitted onto a journal. How you want to get your visibility as an author will come from the fact that if this article within a journal is indexed within Scopus, because I understand that within Malaysia, you have to fulfill MARA 1 and MARA 2 qualifications, right? So this is why it's important to make sure that the article you're submitting to a journal is indexed within a accredited platform and standard. So only once that workflow is all done, right, then you can go through and to understand what goes on in the process for a journal to actually be accepted within Scopus. So I've talked quite a fair bit about the entire process. I may have lost a little bit of you along the way because of the complications, but hopefully this clarifies with you for those of you who are interested. So the content selection and advisory board covers all journals that are included within Scopus itself. They are the subject experts from all over the world and they're chosen for their expertise in subject areas. And I think this is actually very interesting to share with you on who the list of the content selection and advisory board are. They come from experts from all around the world, from Asia Pacific with a Professor Julie Lee from the City University of Hong Kong, and she is a CSAB member for business and management. You find very interesting other um, key prominent uh, researchers who are the subject chairs over here. And so this is a part where we can give you the live demonstration, right? The demonstration um, on how you can actually do the searches for Scopus as some of you have been asking about. So I will be going through a few use cases with you, how you can explore literature, how you can identify potential collaborators, how you can access the quality or the impact of a paper, how you can analyze journals to read or choose where to publish into, your Scopus author profile, your Scopus affiliation profile, as well as any other topics or questions that I think you guys are filling up the chat with. So very firstly, this is the very basic page for Scopus, right? And you come essentially to what we call as document search. So you'll be able to key in the documents here, and then you'll be able, actually able to search it for either documents, authors, affiliations, or you can do an advanced search on this. If you want to find out more specifically about the journal, you can also compare sources by looking at the sources and metrics. This is the basic homepage that you get when you go to scopus.com, but yes, all of the bells and whistles under the hood. Under the search functions, you can also choose to add on more parameters that you want to include so that you can do your search in a much more efficient manner. So under advanced search itself, this is pretty cool. Um, you can use what we call an outline query break lines. So you can structure and to identify all the errors that you're referring to. You can add Boolean operators, right? And, or, and not. You have prefix and you have with. So you can all type this all in. We also have more field codes for you to type in. And I think what's something which I'm very interested to share with you is that we have up to 64 field codes in Scopus itself. And this is a very large volume. The reason why we are, have gone down to go down to such a level is that when every single article is submitted to a journal that's indexed within Scopus, that one single article is broken down into 64 different categories, right? So within the category itself, you have the abstract, you have the affiliation ID, you have the affiliating city, the country, the organization, you have the author, you have the first name, last name of the author, you have the conference, you have the title, you have the publication year, you have the citations. This is something which you can actually take a look at. So you can definitely use advanced searches within the document search itself. So sometimes you want to use particle interactions and collisions and not theoretical, you will be able to refine all this on um, the single, the basic search function itself. So I've gone through this with you quite a fair bit just now, right? We talk about Boolean operators and or and not. I trust most of you are quite familiar with it because you're giving me pretty good answers during the practice session earlier. I will also encourage you once again to find for variations of a word and to find phrases. So once again, I would really want you guys maybe to take about, let's say give you about maybe two minutes, right? 
for you to see the differences when you're running the search on Scopus as well to make sure that you're familiar with it. So maybe just type in SARS coronavirus 2, right? And then see what answers you get from that. Um, this one, because I think you're much more aware of how this is like, I will let you to run this within one to two minutes. In the meantime, I'll answer the questions that are piling up on the chat list. So a colleague is asking if you can find the same articles in Science Direct and Scopus, are they completely different? No, they are not completely different. But like I've mentioned earlier, Science Direct gives you full text documents published by Elsevier. Scopus gives you a record of all of um, a large volume of index journals in the world. So the methodology will be for you to search on Scopus and then link this over. And if you find that this article is published by Elsevier, and if you want the full text article, then you go towards Science Direct. So this is the method that you in which you can do your, the methodology and the workflow that you can adopt. For Nia, yes, I was covering the minimum criteria for Scopus actually. Um, if you want more questions, feel free to drop me an email after this and I can point you to a link. Alternatively, we actually have a link for the Scopus criteria that you can search for online as well. So Hakim is asking why certain journals were disqualified after being in Scopus. I actually have a bunch of slides on that, but let me walk you through on what happens. So some journals, sometimes they were not performing to a certain level. Some journals, um, because we do check them based on a level of radar and metrics. Sometimes some journals have standards that slip a little. I wouldn't say it's disqualified. The correct phrase that we use internally is that we stop indexing it. We stop the forward flow. Right. Um, usually this happens after we give out three warnings. So if the first year the journal is underperforming, then we'll, we'll give them a warning letter. If you underperform for two consecutive years in a row, that is when we stop the, um, the forward flow of indexing. We do this to make sure that there are no much, that the whole process is not bloated. We make sure that only top tier journals that fulfill a minimum criteria are indexed. Hi Adila, sorry, I'm not too familiar with ERA. Um, ERA previously, they were using Scopus as a metric. And I think this is something that I'm not so sure what's the current status as of the moment. So this one, I'm not too familiar. But I would say that if you're interested to find out more, if you are interested to find out if the journal is indexed in Scopus, do feel free to conduct a search on it. I'm usually very wary of saying that, oh, this this metric or this board has all its journals index and scopus. I never say that. So even when we, even though for Elsevier, we have approximately about 91 plus percent of all our journals being indexed in scopus, I would say not all our journals are indexed. That's why I'm very clear to caveat this. Ah, Dr. Iqbal has a very good question to know if the journal is in the top Q1, top 50 percentile in scopus. I will cover this shortly as well. Ah, okay, so there's a uh, Professor Siva Palan who is asking in some of the journals index in Scopus are under the predatory journals listed by BU's list. That is a very good question. So first and foremost, I think I'll walk you through the content selection advisory board. First and foremost, these subject chairs, these are all experts in the field, right? And these are the ones who really uh, verify if a journal is to be included in Scopus or otherwise. So Bill, Jeffrey Bill himself, he's more or less an academician who was interested in this. So he created and compiled a list that I believe he does not actively curate as of the moment. So one thing which I would also do is that Scopus as a platform and organization, we are not flawless. There are times that we may have incidentally indexed it, but if that's the case, do let us know, do highlight us and highlight it to us, and then we can discontinue it. Right, And I'll also say that this percentage of predatory journals that are indexed in Scopus, it is a very marginal percentage. And one of the best cases that I actually want to share with you 
and I think this is very interesting, is that there was an art, there was a journal that was apparently indexed in Scopus that was also a predatory journal. But when I look at the journal itself that was predatory, I realized that it had a different ISSN code from that of the journal that's actually indexed on Scopus. So it just means that there are predatory journals out there who lift journal titles from Scopus. They, co they copy the exact same journal title, but because the ISSN codes are different and unique, they are not able to copy that. So I would say, first and foremost, please check the ISSN code that of the journals that are indexed in Scopus, as well as the predatory journal, because that is a very important way to understand the difference. So Lenovo is asking, if you want to submit to Scopus, the chances of your paper to be published will be low. No, I would say, first and foremost, you submit to the journals that's indexed on Scopus. And I would say, choose the best journal for you to submit it, right? So all journals have to be published regularly on Scopus because we want to make sure that the journal itself is a self-sustaining journal, it has a reputation. So this is something that you want to bear in mind with, right? At the end of the day, you should take pride in your research work. Your research work, if you're confident in it, it should be indexed and published. So either way, choose the best journal for your best work to be shown. I don't know what you mean by Simalgo being journal, uh, being illegal, to be honest, because it's also a different type of journal ranking. So I can't really say that. I've not heard that it's actually illegal, to be honest. Okay, so I think I've covered enough questions for the time being here. I will now move on to the exercise that some of you have been sharing with me. So what you can do for under the SARS coronavirus 2, you can simply search for 526 documents, search for novel coronavirus. If you want to expand it, right, which is why there's an all function, include COVID-19 or 2019 NCOV or any of the other modifiers that we are looking at. I would say the same also applies for it. So one of the key ones, for instance, if you're looking for, say, a smart controller for your air conditioning system, you can look for controller at the search field, at the end modifier, at end con asterisk. Or sometimes you want to add the term smart controller, right? And this allows you to narrow down your search parameters in a much more specific way. Okay, this is the part which I think is actually very interesting. And within Scopus itself, um, and I'm actually think that this has gone a very long way since I came on and joined Elsevier you're able to refine your search results. And this is actually very important. You want to sometimes look for the most relevant year in which the article is published. Maybe you want to take a look at the 2018 versions or the 2017, right? You're able to get a historical idea of what research articles are trending for these specific keywords. You are also able to filter it down based by an author whom you follow, the subject area which you're interested in, the document type that you're interested in, the source title, the keywords, the universities that published it, as well as the country territory. This is actually a very, very, very powerful tool. And then you can choose to simply <clears throat> export everything to download or to view the citation overview or to analyze the search results. I'll go through this in more detail later. You can sort this based on the date in which the most recent article is being published, right? Or by the total number of citations which you have received. So this is something quite powerful because Scopus itself is updated on a daily basis as well. You'll be able to see once again the abstract record. So for instance, if you're interested in this article on nanometric magnetites, you're able to click on the abstract. You'll be able to find out more about this article itself. And this brings us to the document page. It looks like a very busy page. It really is, but it gives you a lot of details. So let me walk you through. First foremost, you'll be able to see the contribution of the authors, which authors have worked on this article, which is again for simulation toolkit. You can see the institution in which the authors are from so that you can collaborate better with them, right? We also provision you with metrics and I'll go through this with you in more detail later. You'll be able to see the total number of citations there are in Scopus and a metric which we call as the few weighted citation impact. We will also provision you with all metrics such as Plum X metrics. You'll be able to see the abstract of this article, the keywords, as well as the index keywords which we are looking at. Similarly to Science Direct, you can see the documents that have cited this article 
within Scopus itself. So we track all the internal links between all the articles that are indexed on Scopus, which have cited this article, right? So you're able to see how this research has been able to grow forward. You'll also be able to see the related documents. The related documents which showed based on other similar documents that have the similar keywords. So let me share with you more on the article metrics module because I think this is actually a very, very powerful, powerful tool. So first and foremost, you can one, see the total number of citations, which is actually very important for you to measure your um, impact of research. We have what we call a few weighted citation impact. So what does this mean? Well, we all know that all subject disciplines, they all have different uh, impact and citation behavior. For instance, if you're doing mathematics, the number of citations you're getting will not be the same as that of when you're writing in medicine or health science. It's just the nature of the subject discipline. So the few weighted citation impact, what it does is that it normalizes this. So now you're able to compare a mathematics journal to the global average of mathematics journals in the world out there. You're able to compare this um, health science journal to the global average of health science journals out there. So one is the global average. So you can see that in this case, this article, it has performed 134 times higher than the global average. And this is actually a very, very powerful tool. You'll also be able to see a whole range of other metrics, such as engagement highlights, et cetera. You'll also be able to see the citation benchmarking to see how well these journals have been getting in terms of total number of citations. Again, you are able to export all this content over to Mendeley as well. So you're actually able to analyze the search results and to export this clearly and broadly as well. We try to make sure that it's easy for you to select it. Some of you are asking how can we export it? Very straightforward. Select your method of export. If you want to export from Scopus to Mendeley to RefWorks to EndNote or, you, or simply to an Excel spreadsheet. This is something which we can do. So another thing which I do like is what we call the, the, um, the results analysis. And this is actually very powerful. So if you're looking for say particle interactions or for COVID, simply analyze the search results. There are some key things that you'll be able to see here, right? You'll be able to see which are the top journals that publish this content, who are the top authors that are specializing in this research area and the documents that are published by the affiliation itself. This is something which I think is really, really, really powerful. And the more practical application for yourself as a researcher or as a student is that when you're looking for a specific topic per se, maybe you want to find out which year is the best year to do a research article in, right? So back in 2003, SARS was trending very rapidly. So you can see that there'll be a spike in terms of documents published by that year. Sometimes you may also want to collaborate with the subject matter expert within the field which author has published the most research, right? Which institution is publishing the most research? So this, in a way, gives you a very strong um, understanding and clarity on to understand who is the best person that you may want to work and to collaborate with. At this point in time, I have a pile of questions. So let me address this first. Okay, um, where can you get the analyzed results within the website itself? Okay. So let me bring you here. So you probably may have missed this. It's right here. So simply type in the search results. You need to select all the articles and then you can analyze the search results. I think this would bring, bring you to the page that you're asking about. Okay, moving forward. We also set up, allow you to set up search alerts on Scopus itself so that this is actually able for you to get clarity. So simply type in um, the alert itself, set up the alert. You can set it on a weekly basis on a specific day of the week, and you can do it in by email format that you're looking for. Another way that you, we think that I actually want to share with you is what we call ORCID. So this ORCID is for you to manage your profile as a researcher. So this happens very commonly when you have three Dr. Smiths, a Dr. Johnson, 
Smith, a Dr. James Smith, a Dr. Jason Smith, right? Um, their names are very similar. So how do we disambiguate this? So a very key approach that we do is what we call ORCID. So this think of this like a passport or an IC holder, IC number for a researcher, right? This is what we call a persistent digital identifier that distinguishes you from every other researcher. So now in this case, a Dr. Smith will be able to have his own um, identifier over here. And then this is a very good way for you to distinguish yourself from another author with a very similar name. So please, if you want to actually take a look and if you want to use Scopus much more thoroughly, if you want to monitor your career as a researcher, please do sign up with ORCID. It makes your life a lot easier. Another thing that I wanted to share with you is what we call Plum X metrics. And this is also a very new tool. Within the Plum X metrics, you can see that it's broken down into five major categories in terms of usage, in terms of captures, in terms of mentions, in terms of social media, and in terms of citations. So remember these five colors, right? Green is usage, purple is captures, yellow is mentions, blue is social media, and citations. So we put them in what we call a digital visualization known as a Plum print. So when you roll over the Plum print, you can see the detail for each of the categories, right? Each of this circle is dynamic. So every the whole thing is dynamic. So each circle represents the metrics in the category by the color. The larger the circle there are, the more metrics there are in the category. And this is a variety of ways to represent the plum print on article pages or in results lists. And this is used to communicate engagement without the score. So for instance, you'll be able to see over here, the plum print here. You can see that total number of citation indexes, you can see the total number on terms of cross-ref and publication metrics. You can see the usage on EBSCO. You can see the captures on Mendeley. How many times it's trending on social media, on blogs, on news, on Wikipedia, as well as on social media such as Facebook and Twitter. So this is something I think which is really interesting given how engaged we are in the social world today. This allows you to find out the impact of research. The author search is something which I think is really cool. I decided to take example from a professor Hanafi Ismail from USM, right? So simply type in the last name, the first name and the affiliation. If you have the ORCID ID, key in the ORCID ID as well. So a professor Hanafi Ismail, you can see that he has over 700 documents for over 12,000 citations with a H index of 51. This is really high, right? So Scopus doesn't just only exist as a search methodology for you to do searches, you know. It also allows you to ascertain who are strong collaborators. So if a professor Ismail here is one of your um, lecturers, feel free to go to his profile and you can stalk him, you know. It's a very interesting way to see how powerful and how established your lecturers are. So you can see what areas of research that they are doing. So you'll be able to first find out what the author details are, right, under here. You'll be able to find out documents, citations, H index. You can also find out the profiles as well. So another thing which I'll be the first to say is that within Elsevier, with, there are always going to be errors within a database as massive as Scopus. There is no denying it. We definitely own it because we have over 77 million records. Which is why what we have done is that we actually have provisioned you with a solution so that you can do corrections on your author, right? So by providing this, you can connect to ORCID. You can also choose to um, edit your own edit author profile here. So if you feel that there are articles that are missing from your profile or if the profile is misattributed to you, you are now have the flexibility to remove this or to make changes to this. We allow you to conduct your searches uh, functionality by toting, by showing you the total number of documents published by the author, the documents, as well as for you to understand who his co-authors are. And we allow you to actually sort this by his most recent article or by his most cited article. In this case, it's a thermal characterization of uh, reinforced silicon rubber as a thermal pad for heat dissipation. And of course, you'll be able to find out the author history as well. So you're also able to do an affiliation search for USM. So when you type in University of Science, you'll also be able to see that um, under that, you can see a University of Science Malaysia under Gelugor. So that's obviously you guys, right? You'll also be able to see USM campus, uh, health campus in Kota Baru or USIM. 
So very interestingly, what I'll show you is that this is the overall profile for USM. And you can see that there's actually an affiliation hierarchy, which includes all the other affiliations that you saw just now from USM. So now you're able to see how prominent your university is when it comes to research, right? In terms of documents, in terms of authors, in terms of, a, yeah. And this is actually a very specific way for you to understand about the overall impact which your university is contributing. So I talk about the author and the affiliation wizard just now, right? So it gives a very comprehensive view on this world of research. So the profile generation uses um, data processing to showcase and your profile based on your name, email, affiliation, subject area, and citations, right? So this is something that we encourage you to leverage on based on the author and affiliation profile wizards. Please feel free to use this. The question that people were asking from some professors were asking just now during the meeting were, how do I identify which um, journals are considered as Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, right? Based on Scopus. So this is actually it. The source browser is actually a very, very, very powerful tool for you to understand what are top tier journals within Scopus itself. And how we do this is that we have a whole range of metrics that we share about. I won't go through this because this is a lot to go through. So very quickly and more to the point, I'll point you to the Scopus sources itself where you can take a look at this. So you can see the total number of results for all the total number of journals that have been indexed on Scopus. You have to key in the title of the journal or you can simply type key in the ISSN of the journal or the publisher that you're looking at. And you have the whole range of metrics that we are talking about in terms of site score, in terms of SGL, in terms of SNP, et cetera. So like I said, you won't find that, you know, all SGL journals are in Scopus. These journals that have been indexed in Scopus, they will have what we call the metrics that are linked to SGL. So under the source page itself, you can see that this specific journal, Earthquake Engineering and Structural Dynamics, these are the coverage years from 1973 to present, or what we can see right now is 2019. We can see that the publisher is from John Wiley and Sons. And what I was talking about was the ISSN number that you can see over here, right? You can see the site score value, the SGL value, and the SNP value that you can see over here. And you can see the site score calculation as well. This is something very, very powerful as well. And so the journal analyzer gives you a selection for all of the metrics that you want to do. Sometimes you want to compare one journal to another. So simply select the journals that you're looking at, and then you can run a range of selections, right? Based on site score, SGL, SNP, citations. I'll go through this in detail. And now this is a part that some of you will be asking me questions on. We talk about metrics all the time. I hear site score all the time. I hear SNP, I hear SGL. What is the difference? So first and foremost, site score is a metric that's developed by Elsevier. It's our own in-house metric that we developed in 2017. And it is done to give a comprehensive, transparent, and current view of a journal's impact. Unlike impact factor, it uses a three-year citation window. And also, what we do is that we take a look at the total number of um, citations from the same number from a specific year, in this case, 2019, divided by the total number of documents from the three years preceding it from 2017, 16, 17, and 18. This includes articles, reviews, letters, notes, editorials, conference papers, and other documents. So the other comparison metric that we will come up with and we'll show and talk about will be what we call SNP, which is a source normalized impact per paper. So this corrects for few differences. Remember I was talking about mathematics and health sciences. The SNP does this, but at a journal level, right? So don't confuse FWCI that I was talking about with SNIP. FWCI is applicable on an article level. SNIP is applicable on a journal level. So even though they have a readily understandable scoring scale of one, don't get confused by it. So some of you also have been talking about SGL, a very fair amount, right? And I know SGL is very, very um, often used in Malaysia. So what I will share is, this basically uses a prestige count, right? So what we want to say is that if a journal has been cited more often by a more prestigious journal, the more prestigious journal shares its prestige with this because it shows that the research that this journal is producing has value. And this is a simple understand metric for site score. I think it's easy for you to more to understand how it works. You take a look at the citations from three years of documents and it's divided by 
the total number of documents from the three years preceding it, right? So when it comes to impact factor, it takes citations from two to five years and it uses citable items, right? Which is a bit different from A. So in this case, the denominator score is actually more finite. So under the source browser page that you can see over here, this is how it looks like. The coverage is from 1979 to 2019. You can see it's under Elsevier, the ISSN. And the one thing which I, want, I really do want to point out to you is please take a look at the site score 2018, which is a static and the dynamic tracker, as well as the site score rank. The rank is where it answers a lot of questions that many of you are asking. So if I want to find out what's the top tier journal in my subject area, how do I do this? Simply go to the source browser, type in the journal. You can see how this journal ranks accordingly to its other peers. So when you select this specific section here, when you click on the rank, you can see this journal cell is ranked number one out of 189. And this ranks this in the 99th percentile, correct? So in this case, if you're looking for say Q1, you're looking for the top 75 percentile, right? If you're looking for Q2, you're looking for the top 50th percentile. It just works like that. And I think more crucially, sometimes when you're looking for journals to publish in, this is a very good way for you to understand which journals are top tier journals for you to want to publish in. So I gave an analyzer browser, so you can take a look and you can compare one journal to another, right? So I'm looking at cell, nature medicine, and plus biology. I can see, see how well they're performing by site score. I can see how well they're performing by SGL, by SNIP, by citation, total number of citation counts, total number of document counts. And this is actually one of my favorite, which is what we call percentage not cited. It shows how many percent of a journal is not cited by anyone. So it shows the value of the overall performance of the journal. Also crucially, as an early career researcher, you probably want to publish in a journal with a low percentage not cited because it means that there's a higher chance of your article to be read and cited, right? So this is a metric which I think is really effective and powerful. So I'm going to go through this section a bit quicker because I realize that there's a power of questions that's piling up and I think we probably do want this Q&A section. So let's take a look at the affiliation profile. So one thing which I want to point out is that when you're looking at USM, you notice that there's uh, documents from the whole institution and the documents from affiliation only. So to clarify that, the one that you want to look at is probably the whole institution because the affiliation only refers to the subsection, right? Because USM comprises more than just from Galugo, right, in Penang. It also includes um, the one from USM Health Campus. So if you want to find out the whole bunch of research that USM is producing, then please select the whole institution. This is a more accurate way for you to get an idea. You can also see which are the collaborating affiliations that USM is working with and you can find the total number of documents by source. So this is the total number of document results, right? Some of you may want to take a look at the citation overview. So we do have a limit in terms of a citation performance for each of the articles. As a librarian, I imagine many of you to face this pretty often because we only have a limit on 2000 that we can show at once. If you want to generate a larger, prof a larger record list, then you need to fill in a form, which is really fast to fill in, about 10 seconds, and then we'll send you the Excel spreadsheet. And we talk about search results, right? And let me give you this specific example for USM, because now that we have looked at the whole bunch of um, articles that are published by USM, we can now do a proper thorough search on this. So when you analyze the search results, you can see that USM has been publishing since 1967, right? And then you see that all of a sudden in 2007 onwards, that is when research output really went up, right? Then there was a decline in terms of output in 2017, but in 2018, 19, and 2019, this is when you can see that this USM has published the most number of research articles in its lifetime. So congratulations, this is fantastic. If you're wondering why is it that there's only 1,000 right now in 2020, it's because you know we're only a third of our way in. So that's probably why. And I also point you out, take a look at the documents by the author, by the affiliation, and by the documents in country and territory, right? You can see in this case, USM has a very strong research output in terms of engineering, material science, medicine, physics, chemistry. I'm sure you guys know that. The other thing which you may want to look at is to look at the top authors that USM has, when you can select it by the authors um, from the affiliation page. 
you can find out more about Prof Professor Hanafi that we are talking about. And this is really a quick overview in terms of the research excellence by USM. So we do have additional, lots of additional help and resources that I want to share with you. So we have a Scopus blog and Twitter, which keeps you updated on the content there is. There is also a very useful live chat help and tutorials that you may want to leverage on as well. We talk about Research Academy. I don't need to go through this again. We talk about the Journal Finder as well. And something which I think that um, I really want to share this with you is actually what we call um, Malaysia as a destination for research excellence. So this is something that we actually have done. This is something which we have done uh, together with, the, with MOE in collaboration with it. So we are actually able to see how well Malaysia is developing to become a knowledge-based economy and the key areas of research, right? So for those of you who are at home, and I think this is very helpful. Feel free to scan this QR code in front of you and you'll be able to get a copy of this paper, right? You talk about the investment in R&D, how Malaysia is improving on the QS university rankings and how it really is trying to grow as a international research destination for faculty and student members. And so yes, to find more information, you can actually link over the blog through Twitter with a librarian toolkit we have Elsevier information on Scopus as well as a newsletter. So I believe this is the part where you guys would want to ask me more questions. So there's a part of it that's already built up. So let me answer it one by one. So Carlos, you're asking on how we can accurately find the research question or our objective in an article. I think that's a good question. Uh, I need to understand if this is what you're referring to for your own research or if you're searching for it. I would say sometimes you're looking for keywords that you know they are intrinsic to your research query and then you can search for it via this research question. The other time that you can want to do is to also refer to the abstract. The abstract would be a very, very good um, summary of the article that you're looking at on Scopus. Rasmi is asking if you can search Scopus for your research topic. Yes, please do do it because there's 77 million articles on Scopus, there will definitely be hundreds of hits for what you're looking for. So someone searching for work-life balance, I would suggest that you can put in work-life balance in brackets, right? And then this will come up as a search as well. So someone is also asking the difference between site score and SJL. So like I went through that slide, site score itself is basically the total number of citations divided by documents. So it's a citation per document performance, right? So SJL itself is why we do a prestige calculation. So this metric here is a lot more complicated, but SJL has an internal metric for calculating it. But think of it as a recognition of publishing in a prestigious journal. And that's kind of a good like layman's understanding of it, I would say. Uh, sorry, if you lost your pocket number, how do you track it? Hmm. Well, first and foremost, I would say, please save the email. Secondly, I would say if you've published already and your articles are indexed on Scopus, maybe what you can do is to search for that article that you know has been indexed on Scopus. You can click on your profile and you should be able to see your ORCID ID. Yes. Um, Iquan is asking if Scopus recognizes information from Simago. Yes, that's why we have SJR in the metrics. Yati is asking percentage not cited refers to citation index and Scopus. That is correct. Mr. Iqbal is, Dr. Iqbal is asking if a journal is Q1 or Q2, right? So when I pointed out to you just now, let me go back to that slide because actually I wanted, I was showing you that slide specifically for you just now. So first and foremost, So look at the site score ranking over here, right, Dr. Iqbal? Let me know if you're able to see this specific component here. Okay, so what we do for the site score ranking is that we break down, um, we break down all, okay, of all the articles, of all the journals that are indexed in Scopus, we break it down into different subject categories, right? 
So we compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. So first and foremost, cell is broken down into the category for biochemistry, genetics, and molecular biology. This is the, the category itself. The subcategory would be general biochemistry, bio genetics, and molecular biology. So what I would say is that if you're looking to publish within a Q1, Q2 journal, first and foremost, you need to identify your category and your subcategory. If there is a journal that you're looking for, type in that journal within Scopus itself, right? When you type in within Scopus itself, it will give you all the site score rankings that it is in the categories that it falls under. Select this, view the site score trends here, and then you'll be able to see how well the journal performs in terms of Q1, Q2. So now you're able to check if the journal is Q1 or Q2, right? Based on Scopus. But what I think you're also referring to is that the journal is Q1 and Q2, Maybe you're also looking at um, Web of Science, and then what you're looking for is JCR, right? In this case, you should refer specifically to the JCR um, titles itself. That's probably a much more accurate way for you to ascertain it. Because if I'm not mistaken, what you're referring to is probably Myra 2, right? In the case Myra 2, you need to go to JCR. So I would say that for in Czech Ram, you're asking on advanced search and how to search for publication by school. So what I would say is that please go to the affiliation searches. The affiliation search will be a better way for you to do this. Someone, a Wen Chen is asking if a journal that ranks higher in SJL but lower in JCL, how should we interpret the difference? You know what? That's actually a very good question because um, it would always be the case. There is ne never a single um, metric which everyone is agreeable upon. Everyone has their own varying methodologies when it comes to metrics. I think it's perfectly fine if a metric, a journal is high in SGL and low in JCL. It doesn't matter, right? At the end of the day, it's through the quality of the journal. And more importantly, um, an editor that I spoke to from Cambridge, what he shared with me is that at the end of the day, um, as a subject matter expert or within the community, there are always going to be one or two journals that people will tend to gravitate towards because that is where um, the crux of their conversations are, are headed towards. So being in the community, a research community of your own, I, you probably know which journals are good or not. Sometimes in a way, the metrics don't matter. But what I would say is that more crucially, the metrics you're looking at, you should look at it from a diverse point of view and not just only from a single facet. So it's perfectly fine for two metrics to disagree, but you should also probably get an opinion through other metrics as well to get a much more holistic understanding on how well the general performance is like. So it's very interesting to ask when people are asking me about subsets. So for me, I don't know how SJL is like and structured. I don't know if all journals that are indexed in Scopus are in SJL. I'm not certain of that. But what I would say is that all journals indexed in Scopus, they do have an SJL score. Yep, so uh, uh, Mohammed. Ikwan is asking and sharing that there are two different um, journal databases numbers when it comes to Scopus and Simago. I would say that it really, for me, my question for you guys is why is there a concern um, for, in understanding these numbers? Because this is something I need to know why before I can answer. Broadly speaking, and I say broadly speaking, at the end of the day, if you want to publish an article within a journal, you should probably look for the specific databases that you're looking at and then decide if that journal is of top quality. Most of the time, I would say, why, most of the time, the Q1 and Q2 journals, they have a very strong incidences with one another. So if you're shooting for those journals, it should perfectly be fine to go in. You probably would not, a Q1, Q2 journal would probably overlap across almost all the ranking systems, all the, rank, all the journals ranking systems itself. How long does a journal stay as a Q1 journal? So, this is really a JCR question, right? But I would say that every year, JCR is updated on an annual basis in June to July. So JCR 2019 will probably only be available in June, July, 2020. In Scopus, we have over here in this metric here, a static link, and you can see that this is consolidated by May, 2019. We have what we call a uh, updated live tracker 
to show you how well the journal is performing. And this is updated on a monthly basis. So if you look at, say, site score, you can see that the site score 2018, the site score 2019, the site score 2017. The same for JCR as well. So I think that answers your question. Okay, so I think I actually finally reached the end of the questions that people have been typing. Um, if anyone wants to ask me any more questions, I can keep this chat box open for maybe a couple more questions or a couple more minutes. Okay, so I think this has actually been a pretty productive question, session. Um, I don't think I've had so many questions coming out on the chat box uh, during a meeting itself, but thank you so much for everyone taking the time here. Um, I would really appreciate it if you guys can actually complete the survey monkey form that you have over here. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to drop me an email. Um, this recording, I will share it together with the librarians and will disseminate it over to you. And yeah, if okay, I have one last question actually. Um, if the journal is indexed in Scopus to 2018, does it mean that it's not indexed now? Okay, this is a very good question, and people have been asking me this question um, for this specific year. So what we have done historically was that we always kept it open as active, but like someone mentioned earlier, and which like we mentioned discussed earlier during the presentation. Um, we do discontinue journals itself. So I would say that please look at, um, the, and there are a few ways for you to look at this. One, Scopus publishes an active journal title list and a discontinued sources list. So you should be able to find this online as well. You can find out which journals have been discontinued on Scopus. The other one which I will also point out is that if you go to a specific, if you want to make sure that the journal is still active, please go to the journal sources list itself Look at the years of coverage. You can see that it's um, from maybe 2020 20, 20, 2002 to 2019. It probably means that it's still active. If you're looking, at, and then another thing that you can also be looking at is to look at the most recent um, journal that's indexed on Scopus. If you can see that it's in 2020, it just means that the journal is active. So you probably need to go a bit deeper. We just wanted to make sure that things were clearer and more definitive, which is why we don't just put it all as active as of the time being. So if you see that the journal itself is uh, active as of 2019, it probably still is active. So thanks, Inky. That's a very good question. Um, I should have brought it up as well. But I think it's something that people have been asking me more often too. Okay, yeah, I think if that's all, that's it. Thank you so much for spending two hours here with me. Um, it was good fun and thank you. Um, I hope you were all able to find out more about Scopus itself. Thank you for sharing your questions with me. I hope I've been able to address that as well. So thank you, um, do have a nice day and please stay safe and be well during this period. Thank you so much.